You may be familiar with the phrase skin to skin with mom and baby and that it is important, but have you heard of kangaroo care? What is it and why is it important to your relationship with your baby? Today we are talking to Sejul Facharia, Kappa certified postpartum doula, and you're listening to Newbies. He's gorgeous. Um, it's a girl. Surprise! The whole family's here. So when are you having the next one? It's just poop. Ready for another? Wow, you look really tired. Ready to go back to work? Yellow poop? Seriously? Did you sterilize this? Sex? Now? You've got to be joking. You should sleep when the baby sleeps. She doesn't look anything like you. I thought you already had your baby. I did. Babies don't come with instructions, so there's newbies, helping new moms and new babies through the first year. Welcome to Newbies, broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. Newbies is your online, on-the-go support group guiding new mothers through their baby's first year. I'm your host, Kristen Stratton. I'm also a certified birth doula, postpartum doula, and owner of in Season Doula Services. If you haven't already, please visit our website at newmommymedia.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can also subscribe to our show through iTunes, so you'll automatically get new episodes when they're released. Sunny's here to tell us all about the ways you can participate in our new show. Okay. Hi, everybody. We'd love to hear from our listeners. We believe this show is all about you guys, and so we want you to start contributing or continue to contribute to the show. Um, and there's some great ways you can do that through the segments we have on our show. So uh, one of the ones I wanted to highlight here is something we're calling five-minute birth stories. We all have birth stories, and um, usually we like to share them with people, and so um, we've created this segment. We can't do like a whole episode on it per se, but um, um, in five minutes or less, if you can share your birth story and some of the highlights, we would love to hear it. And we'll we'll put those in um, future episodes when we release them. Um, another idea would be, you know, if you ever have any comments or questions about the show or if you have, you know, ideas for different episodes you want us to do, we are all about listening and we'd love to get mail from you guys. So if you are interested in sending us email and letting us know what you think about the show, that's fantastic. You can do all of this through our website at newmommymedia.com. There's There's a contact link there so you can email us. And then also um, we have kind of a new way that we're doing voicemail. You can always call us on the phone, but another way that might be easier for some of you that really like using your computer is through our website. There's a little gray banner on the side that says send voicemail. And when you click that, you can actually just leave the message through using your computer and the speakers and the microphone that's on your computer. So um, just kind of another alternative for you guys to get in touch with us and um, check out those segments because they are really fun. And we really enjoy listening to them and hearing what you guys have to say. All right, let's meet our panelists. Hi, I'm Brittany. I'm 26. I'm a stay-at-home mom, and I recently started a birth doula business. My, I have one little girl. She is 11 months old. Hi, I'm Ruthie Slada. I am 29. And I own Mama Ruthie, which is a postpartum support business. I am a clinical lactation specialist. I am a postpartum doula. I do uh, belly binding and sealing and placenta encapsulation, so on and so forth. And I have a five-year-old boy, a two-year-old girl, and a six-month-old girl. And you also paint pregnant bellies. Oh, and I paint pregnant bellies, yes. That's (laughs) so cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Called the painted oven. (laughs) Um, my name is um, Jesse. I'm 26. I am a childbirth educator and a doula. Um, and I have two little ones. Um, my oldest, two and a half, she was a preemie. So this subject is close to my heart. And then my youngest, my son, is um, almost a year. Great. Thanks for being on the show. Okay, so before we get started with today's show, um, I found a news headline uh, floating around the internet that I thought was interesting. Now, I need to preface this and say this did not take place in the U.S., okay? So before every, any mom like has you know a coronary or something over this, don't worry, but this was not in the U.S. But it is something that we, um, at least if you've given birth in a hospital setting, that you uh, may have some experience with. And um, I gave birth to four babies in a hospital setting. So the situation is this. This happened in Malaysia, okay? Um, and it was at a private medical center. 
center. And basically, um, it's kind of like those movies you see and, you know, where babies get swapped in the hospital because they're not identified properly. And and this is what kills me. Um, one of the couples whose, you know, baby was switched, basically, um, it literally says, it says, last Tuesday, a couple were shocked when they received a call from the medical center informing them that their newborn was swapped with another couple's baby. Um, and it says that uh, the baby was the couple's fifth child. It was born at right about the same time. and um, But they were told of it five hours after taking their baby home. <laughs> so the baby had been home with this couple that really wasn't their parents for five hours before they found out. And it just kind of, you know, obviously this is being handled. You know, there's an investigation and, and they're making recommendations now on how to make sure this doesn't happen. But it reminded me of, you know, giving birth here in the U.S. and how, you know, they're, they're very strict about this kind of stuff. I think my babies had like an alarm on their mm-hmm. on their like yeah. ankle the, the or baby whatever. Lojack. Yeah, baby Lojack. Lojack. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and they were always comparing my bracelet to their bracelets yep. and. I mean, I'm glad that I'm really glad that they do that, but it kind of made me feel like a criminal. I'm like, I'm not trying to steal a baby. Didn't you see my me? baby? Didn't you just cut that baby out of me. Come on. But anyways, wanted to get your guys' you know thoughts on this, and if you have any personal experience with you know giving birth in hospitals and and the whole tracking system. So. Oh yeah. Well, my first two were born at a naval hospital, and they really took this seriously. I don't know if they messed it up once before. I don't know. <laughs> but um, but yeah, they had the little like magnetic bracelet on the ankle, which yeah. what they called Baby Lojack. So okay. I didn't I didn't come up with that <laughs> myself. Um, but yeah, the same thing. Like they had a serial number on my bracelet and yeah. on the baby's bracelet. The baby had two bracelets on one on the ankle, one on the wrist. Okay. Okay. Matching serial numbers, and anytime they had to do anything with the the baby, which what really wasn't much. The baby was in the room with me the right. whole time, but right. they'd be like, okay, one number's on your bracelet. Okay, compare with that. Yeah. But then one time when we were trying to like put socks on our baby <laughs> to get ready to go home, like we knew we were getting discharged, we accidentally bumped the baby Lojack off <gasps> and a nurse came running into the room because what it also does was automatically lock down the whole lab- or whole maternity ward. Oh, wow. Like it locks their um, their door shut and everyone goes to their stations because it sets off an alarm so that <sighs> no one can kidnap your baby, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was a little embarrassed by that. So. <laughs> well, how did they have like some sort of monitor or yeah, something they, over there? Because I'm, I'm, I don't know the technology yeah, behind it, but yeah. I'm sure there was a way to know which room specifically, wow. you know, it went off in. Right. Yeah. Right, so right. some I had a nurse run in our room and then my husband saw it. I didn't see it, but he said there are nurses or, you know, corpsmen at each exit making sure that no one can come in or go out. That's yeah. organized. Yeah. That's a system. I'm glad right? it's that's organized, but I was really, I, I was know. like, it's my baby. I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have experience with this? Um, I think the rooming in helped, you know, like yeah. if she's not in a nursery, she's going to be with me. Right. right. So right, right. I don't think it'd be easy to mix her up if she didn't actually leave my room. That's true. Um, but I did go visit a friend here in San Diego at a, one of the hospitals here, and there was a security guard right by the doors for the maternity floor. Uh-huh. And you actually can't use the main elevator doors to get off at that floor. On the maternity floor, you have to use a separate elevator door so that you're not right by the exit to the hospital. Wow. So, yeah. This is elaborate, you guys. Really (laughs) put some thought into this. Anybody else? Yeah. So when you have a NICU baby, obviously that like really complicates things. So there are bracelets upon bracelets upon (laughs) bracelets. Right. And in order just to get into the NICU ward, if you will, you have to get like scanned in and some printed and they have a very elaborate um, system for that. And then before you can go into your baby's room, our bracelets have to get like double checked and scanned in. And if anytime you leave, then the whole process starts over again, you know, like just getting a quick snack, you're like, I just want to get something to eat. Right. And then you've got to like do this whole big long process. But it actually is, you know, for a mom who couldn't be with her baby all the time, it, I mean, it was a hassle, but you know, it made us feel really comfortable because our little baby's in this room and all kinds of people rocking down the halls, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And our agreement between my husband and myself was always, if anything happens where I can't be with the baby, you go with the baby. Yeah. Yeah. Like even if the baby's leaving to get a hearing test or, Mm -hmm. you know, for a 
well, baby check, like you go and stay with the baby. And I, I mean, I don't know in Malaysia what their, what the man's yeah. role is. Yeah. And that. it doesn't, this article yeah, doesn't So, go you know, maybe yeah, perhaps detail. they don't even have a support person that's with them the entire hospital stay, but, right. um, but that was at least our kind of agreement together. All right. Thanks for your opinions, ladies. Today on Newbies, we're discussing kangaroo care. Our expert today is Sejul Fachadia, a Kappa-certified postpartum doula, trained lactation educator, and is certified in infant tummy time and kangaroo care. Thanks so much for joining us, Sejul, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Sejul, what is kangaroo care, and where did the term come from? So kangaroo care is uh, when you hold a newborn diaper, he can be in the diaper or without the diaper, on the mom's chest, bare chest, it should be a direct chest-to-chest contact between the mom and the baby or the dad and the baby or any other caregiver and the baby if mom or dad are absent. And where did that term kangaroo care? The term actually came from um, uh, Bogota, Colombia. Um, there were two doctors who saw that babies who were preterm were held in the kangaroo position like a marsupial would hold their baby in a pouch. Uh, by the parents, and they were stabilizing much better than other babies who were not. So they saw that the care that was provided was like a kangaroo baby being held in a pouch by the mother, and hence the name kangaroo care came about. So is there a difference between skin-to-skin and kangaroo care, or are they the same but with just different terms? Oh, well... Technically, there is a difference because skin to skin could be a contact between a mother and the baby directly on skin, whether it is a chest skin or cheek skin or while breastfeeding. You know, when we are breastfeeding, we are always in skin contact with the baby if the baby is not wearing anything. But kangaroo care specifically tells you that your baby should be between your breasts and there are nerves that turn on only in response to direct ventral contact with your baby. How soon should a mom begin kangaroo care with her infant? A uh, mom should begin uh, right after birth, and uh, they should continue to do kangaroo care in the first hour after birth, uninterrupted. There should be no separation from the mother and the baby. Can kangaroo care still be as beneficial to a mom who is separated from her baby due to an NICU stay or a cesarean birth? Absolutely. So it is specifically helpful for babies who are in the NICU or even babies who are born with C-sections because those babies have a better chance of, you know, getting their health being turned around with kangaroo care than being in an incubator. Even ventilated babies uh, who are as young as, you know, 28 weeks old can go in kangaroo care. And now the new research is saying that even 22 weekers have done well with kangaroo care Mm -hmm. in the NICU. What are some of the biological changes that happen between mom and baby when kangaroo care is being used? So kangaroo care basically entails uh, three things. It entails the direct skin-to-skin contact within the mom and the baby. And then it includes kangaroo nutrition, which is breastfeeding. And then it includes kangaroo discharge, which is when the baby is discharged, the baby is still doing skin-to-skin with the mom for up to six weeks. And the biological changes that happen is that the baby's temperature is much regulated. They are more immune to uh, infections. Uh, They have a better chance of getting the optimal nutrition, which is through breast milk. And uh, there are so many other benefits, like their heart rate is much stable. They grow better. They sleep better. They breathe better. And their motor development is improved. So this happens while the baby is in kangaroo care. And the recommendation is actually uh, you should do kangaroo care for up to the first six weeks for about two hours every day. And panelists, what were you able to use kangaroo care with your baby during those first few hours, days, weeks? I was. I wasn't able to do it with my daughter because I wasn't familiar with the concept. But with my son, who is nine now, I did it a lot. And how about you, Jesse? Yeah, so um, my daughter was born eight weeks early. So we didn't get to do skin to skin or kangaroo care right when she was born. I had to wait until she was stable to hold her. And it is honestly, I think, the difference between her life 
being here today. It made a really big difference for her. When we did Skin to Skin, I did it now. She was two days old, and it was the first time she opened her eyes when we did Skin to Mm. Skin. And the bonding was amazing. Like, that made such a difference. Being a NICU mom is really hard. So all you NICU moms out there, (laughs) you're doing great. (laughs) It is hard. And um, finding ways to connect with your baby because you can't do all those new mommy things. You can't typically breastfeed right from the get-go. And you can't typically just pick up your baby and hold them and put on a new onesie because they have wires everywhere. And, (laughs) um, you know, their sats go down or up and... Um, kangaroo care helps stabilize all of that. So the more kangaroo care we did, the better. And in our experience, it actually helped me with breastfeeding. It was really hard to sustain milk supply and having her on my skin, you know, as much as I could helped keep my milk. I did lose my milk twice. Um, and so it actually helped me be able to relactate. And then on a personal note, I feel like kangaroo care does a lot of healing, you know, for a mom that's just had a baby, whether you've had it cesarean or, you know, it was like me and it was this unexpected preemie and you're in a whole new world of new terms and doctors and it's very overwhelming. It is such a great time to just sit and be intentional, be in the moment with your baby and not in the past of what could I have done to change the situation or what am I going to do to make up for what I didn't do, you know, just in the moment. Now I can, I can love my baby and this is what I can do. You know, it's the one thing that I could do well. I can hold my baby, you know, I may not be able to produce as much milk or I may not be able to change her, you know, into a new outfit. I can't get her breathing again. I can't, you know, there were lots of I can'ts, but I can hold her and that, that bond has lasted a lifetime. And it was something that my husband could participate in too, you know, for him, it was very scary. And, you know, he was kind of removed in a sense because he didn't carry her in his, you know, stomach and birth her and (laughs) um, he didn't have to pump. And so it was like, where do I fit in this equation? And so for him, the bond they have now, she's two and a half. And the bond they have now is just, it's amazing. And I, I, you know, I accredit that a lot to kangaroo care and So I encourage you. It may be painful. It may be really actually kind of hard to do. And I think people don't talk about that, that it can be painful. This little tiny life. My daughter was three pounds and fit in my husband's palm. And so when you're holding something that tiny, it brings up a lot emotionally. And um, But it is good. It's good to touch your baby. It's good to hold your baby. It does good things for you. It definitely helped me. I had postpartum depression really bad. And every time I was away from her, I plummeted majorly. And so having that skin to skin, I decided after a month of really bad postpartum depression, I was going to room in the hospital and they didn't really want me to do that. And so my husband and I set up mats. We literally slept on the floor in her room for three months that she was in the hospital. And that's when it started to turn around. But that postpartum depression, the breast milk, All of that will get better and easier, even if it's not perfect with kangaroo care. It does bring a lot of um, healing and healing for your baby. Your baby doesn't, you know, their sats and all of that is all erratic. And so it it calms their system as well. So that's my experience. I think it's a really, really important thing. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. (laughs) That's amazing. With my first baby, um, in retrospect, I had some, you know, some postpartum baby blues. Um, I had a hard time bonding with him. Um, I had an episiotomy, and I think the pain medication they put me on was just, Mm. I'm really sensitive to stuff. So I was just, it took me about two weeks to be able to take care of myself, let alone this, like, Mm -hmm. tiny infant. Like, when I think about the first couple weeks with him, the most positive thing I think about is sitting in my glider um, after I've nursed him and that feeling of that little head on your chest. And we call that dear heart. That's your dear heart. That's where only the most precious people go. You know, that's where your lover goes. That's where your children go. You only embrace your closest friends close to your chest. And so I think that that probably did a lot to keep me from slipping into you know, a more serious postpartum depression situation. And I think that, you know, that's like the warmest part of my early postpartum with him was having him in that spot. 
right there. Um, it's great for, like you were saying, breastfeeding because it generates oxytocin, which is what initiates your letdown with milk. Um, it's the love hormone. It's the bonding hormone. And so I think all of that is really, really helpful. And so I, it was very positive for us in, in a much more normal, less extreme situation. Right. Well, it's so. beneficial for, for all moms and babies. For, oh, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we I did more skin to skin than kangaroo care with my baby just because when my milk came in, it was I, I felt like the support actually made me a little <laughs> bit more comfortable to have something on my chest. But with the skin to skin and I do have postpartum depression. So having her there and just drinking in that baby mm-hmm. smell like on my worst days, just taking a nice deep breath and rubbing my cheek on her fuzzy little mm-hmm. soft baby head. And it just brings a sense of calm and the sense of peace over me. My husband did more kangaroo care, but I think it was really just an excuse that he could play video games longer because, <laughs> <laughs> because the baby was sleeping there, so he can't move. <laughs> but, well, so it's kangaroo care is also convenient. <laughs> yeah. But he still, to this day, he still loves it when she falls asleep on his chest. She's not really a cuddler. She likes to just play and be active. And so he loves it when she falls asleep on his chest. And he still likes the excuse to play more video games. <laughs> I love what you said, Jesse, about it being healing because I remember with my third, he was born not doing well. He had an APGAR score of three and then five and then stayed at five. And so he went to NICU and I just remember aching, like just aching for him. And then when um, they brought him back to me, like I had a bunch of people talking to me and then all the room just went silent to me. Like they're still, their mouths are still moving, but I didn't want anything other than my baby on my chest Mm -hmm. and the minute I actually my husband actually has a picture of the Mm -hmm. minute he's on my chest and I was just like (gasps) like just the sigh of relief of having him there and just knowing that he was okay and that he was alive and being grateful and there's just so healing Mm -hmm. to just have him in that position so I just I love that you brought that point up because Mm -hmm. it's so true Mm -hmm. it's so true When we come back, we will continue our discussion about how kangaroo care can be beneficial for the breastfeeding relationship between mom and baby. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. We're talking with Sejul Fichadia about kangaroo care and breastfeeding. Sejul, how does kangaroo care benefit the breastfeeding relationship between a mom and her new baby? So kangaroo care benefits the breastfeeding relationship by Releasing that oxytocin, like one of the moms on the panel said, that, you know, that oxytocin release helps with the letdown of the milk. And another thing that it also does is that when babies are left on the mom's chest, they are already so close to their food source that they do not have to make a lot of effort to wake up and find their food. And that uh, saves some of their calories uh, from being expended. And also, you know, the feeling of calm and the connectedness that comes with breastfeeding lets lets the mom relax and enjoy breastfeeding instead of being worried about where her baby would be when she wants to breastfeed. Uh, So I feel like that oxytocin, which is a powerful love hormone, is very important. And um, it also kind of sends the fatty milk in your breast forward and brings the aqueous portion of your milk. Um, It shunts it to reservoir rear so that the baby gets the fatty milk first. Um, so 20 minutes of kangaroo care, uh, even before any breastfeeding session, will help a mom have a better release of oxytocin, leading to a better letdown, and uh, the baby's getting a higher calorie milk. And I would imagine that would also make it easier for mom to notice the early hunger cues in baby. Absolutely. So the baby is basically staying in the kitchen <laughs> the mom can eat I love that. <laughs> and the baby can eat uh, whenever they want to. Yeah. Open 24-7. At their feet. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And could a mom who is choosing to or who has to use formula still benefit from kangaroo care? Absolutely. Um, the benefits of kangaroo care are not just limited to breastfeeding. As I mentioned earlier that, you know, the temperature regulation is improved. Uh, babies don't undergo any cold stress. There are larger breath volumes. And also, you know, the best thing about 
feeding a baby, even if it is formula, while the baby is in skin-to-skin contact with the mother, is that the oxytocin is still released and the mom still benefits from those relaxing effects of oxytocin. They also have been shown to have more mothering behaviors uh, when they have received kangaroo care. So it's not just about the food. It is so much more than food. And I feel like those babies who um, are given formula need it even more. Is kangaroo care something that dad or partner could do to help bond with their baby? Most certainly. Dads can do it. In fact, I have written a blog post about it on my website on fathers and their feathers. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it came about from a question that was asked to me about their dad that uh, my husband doesn't like to do skin-to-skin contact because he feels like the hair on his chest are going to bother the baby. <laughs> and I <laughs> I had to tell them that it doesn't matter, you know, mm-hmm. what what the father's chest looks like. The baby is going to love being there. Uh, even when fathers, uh, you know, when they say, I cannot give birth and I cannot breastfeed, the way to, you know, kind of bond with your baby is through kangaroo father care. And to our panelists, did your husband or partner use kangaroo care with your baby? He did for my son. Uh, For my daughter, it was like 12 years ago, and we didn't quite realize the importance of it. I wish I had that, and I still regret it. But, you know, one of the reasons I became certified in it is because I want all moms and dads to know that this is something that works, and you don't need any expensive devices and gadgets to um, give the best care to your baby. And what about you, Ruthie? Yeah, no, I can remember uh, my husband definitely, he would game too. Like, (laughs) oh, I let you sleep for three hours. What have you been doing? Oh, we've just been hanging out, playing Halo or whatever. Um, (laughs) And the one thing with the chest hair is there there were obviously instances where they get their little (laughs) soggy fingers wound up in chest hair and they do get (laughs) a startle every now and then. But it's kind of something you chuckle about and so you just, hey, it's an excuse to hold their hands so they don't pull your chest hair, I guess. Yeah. So. <laughs> More bonding. Yes. <laughs> what about you? Yeah, I think it's one of the greatest things that as a husband you can do to bond with your baby, um, especially giving mom a break. <laughs> she has that baby attached to her all the time. And honestly, the nicest thing my husband could do <laughs> was give me a snack and take the baby. <laughs> and um, so kangaroo care went a long way. For our NICU baby, um, we really felt like it helped us bond and keep her healthy and going. We um, continued for her first year of life doing it really regularly. And then when our son was born, my husband could not wait to do skin to skin. He was so excited about it because he knew the benefits of it and what it looks like. And um you know, it's nice when you have those late night feedings and your husband gets the baby and snuggles him and everybody goes back to sleep peacefully. So, yeah, I think it's a really beneficial thing for dads, too. So, you know, dads also have the exact same neural pathways as the mom does in their brains when they do skin to skin contact and kangaroo care for their babies. And it is just that the hormones that they have in the neurotransmitters. They are in different concentrations, but they have a hormone called vasopressin that kind of decreases their blood pressure. So it's really good for the dad's health, too. And say, Jewel, are kangaroo care and tummy time related? Well, they are related in the sense that, you know, both of them happen, you know, the gold standard tummy time is the first two to three weeks, you know, you are doing tummy time on your parents' chest. That's what uh, what I am trained in as a dummy time tutor that, you know, the first two, th- two to three weeks when the baby is outside the womb, they have to be on the parent's chest and that will, will qualify as tummy time. And eventually, you know, as the baby grows, you want to put them, uh, give them a lot of floor time and a lot of movement, um, which kind of improves the breastfeeding, which improves the nervous system function. It also improves how they, you know, how they develop in terms of their motor development. And it it helps them with any of their postural imbalances from birth, you know, how babies are so squished up inside us. So it works. That That is tummy time to me. But kangaroo care itself is definitely you are on your tummy, but you are on the mother's chest and your chest as a baby is in direct contact with the mother's chest. Thank you so much, Sejul, and our lovely panelists for chatting with us today about kangaroo care. 
For our Newbies Club members, our conversation will continue after the end of this show as Sage will give advice to tired moms whose babies will only sleep with being held. For more information about the Newbies Club, please visit our website at newmommymedia.com. All right, it's time for a baby oops story where you can share your funny stories that have happened with your baby since you brought him home from the hospital or wherever you delivered your baby. And um, there are some really funny ones. I love reading these. So this one is hysterical. This comes from Laura, and she's basically giving us a play-by-play on what happened when they discharged her and her family from the hospital. So she says, the on-call doctor didn't realize that she was on call that day and evidently was out of touch with everyone. So after the hospital had called her a billion times and me paging her, she finally showed up at 7 p.m. to discharge us. Then once she had given the okay, the nurse comes in over to go over the discharge stuff with us and all that it entails and tells the nurse at the desk to take Caitlin's bracelet out of the system so she could cut it off without setting the alarm off. You guys know where this is going, right? So we go through all of the paperwork, and like 10 minutes later, she cuts Caitlin's band off. The alarm goes off, locking all the doors on the floor, turning off all of the elevators on our floor. 30 minutes later, they get everything unlocked, and all of that, we were finally able to go home. It was probably 9.30 at night by the time we got home, and we were supposed to have been home by noon. Well, at least we know that the system works, right, Laura? So I guess that's one good thing that came out of this. So if you have a funny baby oop story you would like to share with us, please send it to us. You can go on our website at newmommymedia.com, send it through the contact link, or send us a voicemail straight through the website. You don't even have to pick up a phone anymore. Just click on that banner on the side that says send voicemail, and uh, you can just use the microphone on your computer. Send it that way. So again, thanks, Laura, and we hope to get more of these baby oop stories because seriously, I love laugh my butt off every time I read them. Thanks so much. That wraps up our show for today. We appreciate you listening to Newbies. Don't forget to check out our sister show, Preggy Pals for Expecting Parents, Parent Savers for Moms and Dads with Infants and Toddlers, The Boob Group for Moms Who Breastfeed, and Twin Talks for Parents and Multiples. Thanks for listening to Newbies, your go-to source for new moms and new babies. This has been a new mommy media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. How would you like to have your own show on the New Mommy Media Network? We're expanding our lineup and looking for great content. If you're a business or organization interested in learning more about our co-branded podcasts, visit our website at newmommymedia.com. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.